Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's edition of the Triangle Area SQL Server User Group's Data Science and Business Intelligence Meeting. We are at the end of August, almost, final Tuesday of the month, and we have the pleasure of John Kursky talking to us about how to weave data ops into Microsoft Fabric. So, John, please take it away. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate it. Let me uh, go ahead and share my screen. Here we go. Looks like it just came up for me. So for all, for all of you, I uh, just want to introduce myself a little bit. I'm John Kursky. I work for a company called Client First Technologies. We do a lot of federal consulting for Microsoft BI, and I've been working in the Microsoft space for well over 11 years. I started out with SharePoint, and somebody said, hey, you, we want to do reporting off of our SharePoint lists and our SQL databases. And I looked at Power Pivot and slowly but surely fell um, uh, into other positions in which I was using Power Pivot. And then Power BI came out and been with uh, the product ever since. Um, I've got a certification in Power BI and um, I'm also a, a PMP or project management professional. So a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today in terms of the background comes from managing data analytics projects. So there's gonna be a lot of uh, interweaving of technical stuff, but also from a project management pr perspective, why data ops is important. Um, my contact information is in the lower left-hand corner there. Um, I will stop uh, at a couple points to open it up to questions. Um, if you're interested in the slide deck, uh, I do have the QR code up on the screen right now. I will put it up at the end of the presentation as well. Uh, and any of the code that I share today is under MIT license, so you are free to download it and bring it into your environment. I'll just caution you, uh, if it's bringing it into your own workplace environment, please be aware of any policies that your workplace has about bringing in outside code. All right, so the agenda for today, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about what data ops is for those who aren't acquainted uh, with it and talk about patterns and how they relate to the data ops principles. And then we're gonna uh, take a deep dive into two patterns that you can take with the uh, Power BI and Microsoft Fabric technology and start laying a foundation for not only version control, but automated testing and deployment. And those are gonna be in the forms of the DEX query view testing pattern and a PBIP deployment pattern. Okay, so first off, data ops. What is data ops? Well, um, this concept was born out of a, by a gentleman named Christopher Berg. Uh, he actually works for a company called Data Kitchen, which he founded that uh, provides tools that help teams manage data analytics environments. And he came up with this uh, data ops manifesto which combines some of the best practices from around uh, industry. And one of the things that he noticed, um, and one of the reasons I got into data ops was there was a lot of best practices that came from um, product development, from project management that wasn't inherent in a lot of the data analytics projects that I either started or the folks that I worked with were familiar with. And data ops combines kind of three major areas to help data analytics projects and data projects succeed. The first is DevOps. DevOps combines the ideas of continuous integration and continuous deployment so that you can automate aspects that you would normally do manually, uh, especially in like the Power BI and Microsoft Fabric space, like publishing a, a file to the service and running tests manually. These are things that you wanna try to automate. And this is what DevOps uh, wants you to try to uh, strive for. Um, this is obviously easier said than done, but as you can imagine, um, a lot of us in the industry, when we work with like Power BI or Microsoft Fabric, we become a victim of our own success. We produce a really nice looking dashboard or report, and then we're asked to do another one, and then another one, and then another one, and then sooner or later, you're up to like 25 to 50 different artifacts in the Power BI workspace that you're having to manage and if you're doing all that manually, it becomes almost like an anchor that's dragging at the bottom of the ocean and you can't lift it up and it's slowing you from achieving your next goals or working on the next project or being able to hand it off to somebody else to do. So DevOps strives to automate those aspects. 
The other aspect of data ops is agile. Uh, for some of the project teams that I worked with uh, very early on, there was this concept that, hey, we're going to put this dashboard together, and three months from now, we're going to deploy it and ask for feedback. Well, you would imagine that in that three month period, either the customer changes their mind or they you don't meet their expectation and three months have gone by and they're dissatisfied because it's like, well, why didn't you show me something sooner? I could have give you feedback. Agile tries to break up or coaches you to try to break up your deployments, especially with dashboards and that into logical chunks that you can release and get feedback on, on a weekly or uh, a couple of weeks basis and be able to continue to kind of satisfy your customer saying, hey, we got this new feature out with this dashboard. It might not be the full suite of products that we want or features we want to deliver just yet, but you can see incremental improvement. And if the customer changes their mind or the organization has a strategic change, you're able to pivot a lot quicker. And then the third area, which I, I think is a differentiator from the other like hash, uh, the asterisk ops kind of uh, products out there or philosophies is lean manufacturing. The idea that every pipeline uh, that you build uh, from getting data, maybe from an FTP server, from SQL, going to Power Query, getting transformed, and then maybe showing up your report should be considered an assembly line so that every change that's occurring is being monitored for quality and performance. Every hop in that chain or any transformation is a potential uh, area for failure. And you should be watching every step of that. And if you do, you're less likely to introduce issues in production. And if there is issue, issues in production, you identify them possibly before even the customers do and are able to correct it. So all this uh, these data ops concepts, I won't go too far into it today, <clears throat> but if you're interested, uh, this is the QR code. I got a video and on YouTube that kind of goes through a data ops 101 goes into those aspects a little bit more, <clears throat> excuse me, but data, the data ops is kind of core to the foundation of a lot of the work that my teams do. And we found that when you adopt data ops uh, and the principles that surround data ops, your projects are uh, in a better shape three to six months down the road as you start adopting these principles. And these principles are, agnostic to the technology that you use. I've applied this to tablet projects, to click projects, to SQL projects. Um, what's nice about this is that when you come into a project, no matter what the technology is, if you're applying these principles, then um, you're better off in terms of your uh, project performance. All right, so that kind of brings us to, to Microsoft Fabric. Uh, Microsoft Fabric brings a whole load of different options for you to develop data pipelines. You think about uh, notebooks where you can write Python code and run it on Apache Spark. You have the ability to write T-SQL and query databases. You have Data Lake. You have Data Flows, Gen 1 and Gen 2. You have um, the streaming uh, aspect to it. You've got KQL. You've got the traditional Power BI data a semantic model. I'm going to say data set interchangeably, sorry. Um, semantic models and reports and even dashboards. So there's so many ways to build your data analytics projects with Microsoft Fabric. So I, I just want to kind of uh, level set with you that what the patterns I showed today are maybe a good starting point for you. And you can kind of create your own pattern off of that so that it fits your project. And Fabric gives you a lot of options to kind of build your data analytics projects, to build your data pipelines. And the patterns I showed you today, I've worked in production environments. It's just that it might not be the pattern that you use, but you can adapt it and have your own pattern for your deployments. All right, so we're gonna talk about two principles from data ops. There's 18 in total. I'm just going to talk about two. And these two I find as, as good core foundations into building your Power BI and Fabric um, projects. The, the first, if you can interweave it and you think about each principle almost from a Fabric uh, perspective is each principle is like a set of threads that if you can weave it into your patterns, you're going to have a more successful uh, Fabric or product that you'll be pushing out. And so that first principle 
is called make it reproducible. The idea is that you should be versioning every single artifact or piece of code that you create, whether that be a semantic model, whether that be a report, if you can do it in a data flow, the SQL that you're, you're writing, because if you can version it, you can check for changes. And in the industry that we work in, anytime or that, you know, it's highly likely that if you push something to production and it's a, there's a, a change and it breaks, if you can quickly identify what changed recently, you can usually isolate the issue and be able to roll it back very quickly. Uh, there's a lot of times where if you're working with a Power BI file, you publish to production and it breaks, hopefully you've downloaded a prior version and that's just not really a way that you can be successful at scale. And so what DataOps tries to teach you is try to embrace version control if at least you can look at Git uh, to support it or have a team start learning Git. Sometimes it's a bigger barrier to entry for some teams than others, but it's something we should be striving for as you're growing your, your uh, Power BI, your Fabric projects. The other principle uh, is uh, what I believe is core to any uh, project in Microsoft Fabric or in data ops in general is quality is paramount. You should be testing. Testing serves as the um, safety net for you and your teams to be able to have some level of confidence that when you go hit that deploy button or you go hit that publish button, you're not breaking things in production that you've introduced in the past. There is nothing more disheartening to a customer that they identify a flaw, you fix that flaw, and then a week later, that flaw shows up again. That loses trust. And we want to try to avoid that. And testing helps avoid it reintroducing issues uh, again. The, the second aspect of testing is giving your team the ability to adopt or bring in different semantic models or have another team member work on that semantic model without fear that the change they make is going to break something. And if it does, they don't know about it until they publish to production. Testing avoids that. If you can give somebody a nice test suite, a semantic model, and go make this change, and if all the tests pass, you're good, or the only you are less likely to introduce errors in production, that gives the developer much more confidence in what they're doing. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've inherited a semantic model or I haven't worked on one in like six months and I go into the Power Query code, make a change or update the DAX. And if I didn't have testing and I hit publish, I just kind of go, please, please, I hope I didn't break anything. And you just kind of sit there hoping you don't get the phone call or the teens message that something broke. We want to try to avoid that. And that's where testing comes in. And so these two principles, I put some patterns together and you can see the URL on the screen there. Um, I offer some um, more information written about each one of these patterns I'm gonna show you today, but also templates to help you get started. So you can download the files, uh, open them up, follow some of the inst uh, installation instructions and um, try to see how you can fit this pattern for your own environment. Okay, <clears throat> so the first pattern we're going to talk about today is the DAX query view testing pattern. Now, in the past, it's been really tough to write tests for semantic models in Power BI. And in November of last year, uh, Microsoft introduced uh, the DAX query view, which I'm going to show you in a second. If you're not familiar with it, it is a new kind of feature in Power BI desktop, and they're actually extending it to the service where you can write DAX code against the semantic model that you have open either in the service or the semantic model you have open locally. And this allows you to couple your tests with your semantic model. And the QR code that I have on the screen takes you to a GitHub page that kind of explains this um, further, as well as has links to the, the code. So for the DAX query view, I'm gonna pull up the a sample Power BI desktop. This is included in the GitHub site that I share with you. And I'm going to use Zoom it here. Um, for those who have at least like the May, June, or I'm sorry, the June, July, or August release of Power BI desktop, 
this button shows up by default now. Um, for some of you, you might have to go into the options and settings. And under preview features, it might show you a DAX query view uh, right around here. If you have an older version of Power BI, anything older than May of this year and, or, um, and later than November of 2023, it's a preview feature, but it went generally available um, early this summer. So when you click on the DAX query view, you get a bunch of tabs here on the bottom that you can create and actually write DAX that can query the model. So in this case, I've got a bunch of tables here uh, that I could query. And uh, if you're not familiar with that uh, DAX, you can use the evaluate function and I can like query this table, hit run, and it will show you the results. And for me, I'm, I'm lazy or I'm not that great of a DAX writer. One of the cool things about uh, DAX query view is you can actually just right click and then there is for each of the tables, there's these quick queries and you can pick the top 100 rows. So if you're familiar with SQL Management Studio, you can do like top 1,000 rows, very similar. You can get the top 100 rows of a table. And you can see I didn't write this DAX. It wrote it for me, Power BI Desktop. And when I run it, you can see it pulls all the, the contents back. And if I was to change it, just get me the top row, I get one row back. So what's nice about this is this kind of can be a, almost an exploratory area in which you can write code, have kind of a workbench to query your model. Um, and you can get like statistics as well. So not only can I look at the, the rows, but I can get statistics on the rows. So if I click on show column statistics, I can actually get the count, like distinct values, the null, the min, the max, any other statistics. And I didn't write any of this, this DAX. And what's nice about this <clears throat> is this can like lay the foundation for you to be able to write test cases. Now in the DAX query view pattern that uh, I write about, we use tabs to these tabs down here to actually write tests. So if you're looking down here at the bottom right, this pattern enforces you to use the dot tests kind of a suffix because some cases you might have test files that you want to use. And in other cases, you might just have a, a tab that you're using for working or checking or, or just writing some code that you're using almost as like a scratch pad. And we don't want to intermingle those. So we have a naming convention uh, in this pattern in which you kind of put a suffix at the end of dot T-E-S-T-S -S or dot T-E-S-T, -E either plural or singular. And when you do that, uh, I've got a couple examples in this file. What we try to enforce is DAX likes to output tables. And what we want to do is output a table of test results. And if that test result follows a specific pattern uh, across any of the test files, this sets ourselves up for automation in the future, but also makes it easy for our teams to interpret. If they know if the table always looks the same way, it's very quickly to hone in to the, to the problem tests. And this pattern that I write about has four columns and there you're going to see three here. And what's nice about DAX is you can kind of build your own table using the union in the row function. So you can actually create a row of data using this row function. And the first argument is the column name. The second argument is the value. And if you union those rows together, you can kind of build your own table of results. And so this enforces, this pattern enforces a schema in which you have a test name, the expected value, and the actual value. And then at the bottom, I add a, a fourth column that just makes sure that the expected value equals the actual value. And when I run this test, you can see that I got the test name, the expected value, the actual value, and whether or not that test passed. 
And our teams that I work with, we try to enforce this kind of pattern across the different ways that we want to test our model. Now, what ways do you test your model? Well, there's a, a couple different ways that you want to, to think about when you're working with, with a model. Uh, the first is the, the content of the, of the semantic model you want to, to take a look at, you want to test. And what I mean by that is, you know, there's often times that maybe you're working in Power Query and make a change and you'd like to know, did you inadvertently mess up the amount of rows that are returned? Or does the set of values in a column change? So let me tell you or show you just one of the, the classic errors that I'll make from time to time. Um, actually saw it last week when I was working with somebody. So let's say you were working in your uh, model here and I go to modeling um, or I go to the data uh, and I wanna go to the Power Query window and I will drag that over here just a second. There we go. So let's say I'm, I'm working um, in the date dimension and I I'm troubleshooting something because I can only see about a thousand rows and I add a couple filters here. Um, maybe I'm, I'm just looking for a filter where it contains um, just like 1940 and I'm working with it. Everything looks good. And then I go and close it. Well, often the problem is you don't realize it until it's too late that you left that filter in there. Um, I usually ask people to show a hands. Uh, when I've shown other people this, this happens to a lot of folks. Um, it's very easy to leave a filter inadvertently. And the only way that you can try to make sure that uh, it's not in there inadvertently, uh, if you don't use testing or this pattern is you've got to inspect the, 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 um, the Power Query code, which is not very efficient. What you'd rather test to see is like, all right, well, I know I should have um, every record between 1940 and 2000. And if I don't uh, fit in that range, then I've got a problem. And you can write a test for that. So I'm going to remove that filter real quick, come back to the DAX query view window, and show you just some of the ways that you can test for the content. Uh, what I typically do when I'm trying to test for content is I will actually just open up a new tab in my semantic model and use the card visual. And so let's say I want to make sure I've got uh, records in from the date dimension. I'll drag this and do like a count. And instead of me writing the DAX code, I will use the performance analyzer start recording so if you're not familiar with the performance analyzer you can go to view you can go to performance analyzer here and if i refresh the visual you could see for that card it actually tracks what dax is being used and you can actually click on this to run the dax query view and so when you click on that, it's going to open a new tab here at the bottom and give you, give you the actual DAX um, code that was written. And if I was to go back here and let's say I want to add another filter, um, I could put a filter in here and I can take a look at the DAX, run the DAX code. And now you can see it also added the filters to be applied to that table. So if you're looking at the content, let's say you know that for a certain fiscal year, your DAX measures should add up to a certain amount or the number of rows uh, for a certain period of time, you can, you can time box it, add the filters, and if that test doesn't meet that number, you know either two things. One, you've updated the Power Query, or two, you've updated the DAX and those two variables have changed and you need to investigate why 
that's not working anymore or that test is failing. And so you can kind of hone in on what's what's going going wrong. And then what you can do is you can take these variables and, and then integrate them into your test. So for example, in this test case, I've got the test down here and all I did was I copied the DAX that came from the performance analyzer and then I'll just reference it in either my expected value or my actual value. So you can actually make some of these tests dynamic um, so you don't have to hard code everything. And when you're, you're testing like this, you can start building that foundation for the content to make sure like, does it actually have all the, the, the rows I need? Does it not have a null count? can show you an example of that. I have a one for table tests. I just took how in the quick queries, how it did the count, and I want to make sure that there's no data IDs with null values or distinct null blanks or the number of null percentage doesn't exceed a certain, uh, certain amount. You know, a, a lot of the times, some of, these, uh, some of these things don't really crop up on us until later. Um, maybe the data source you got from the SQL table, uh, there's maybe only 5% are missing, and then it jumps all the way to 20% or null. Um, if you run these tests uh, on the regular and it jumps from 5% and it hits your threshold, you at least could get notified for it before somebody starts telling you, like, I'm seeing a lot of blanks in one of these reports. This can, this can help you stay ahead of it. So... Content is something you want to test. So you want to test the, the content of your tables, the statistics around those tables. You can test your measures to make sure that they're calculating correctly. But you can also test your schema as well. And in uh, late November, early December of, of last year, Microsoft introduced a set of new DAX functions that start with the prefix prefix of info. And this allows us to query the metadata about the model in DAX. Now in the past, what we had to do is use something called dynamic management views, which uh, didn't really give you the flexibility to like filter and uh, massage the data in, in a way that you need it. Uh, but the info functions let you do that. You get, you get a table of data that gives you information about the tables you have, about the columns that you're working with and the types and the formats. And uh, one of the examples I give you here will actually test to see if your schema has changed from the last time you took a snapshot of the schema. And you can see here, I've actually got a static representation of that schema and I'm gonna compare it to the current schema dynamically. Now, why would you wanna do that? Well, one of the things that can happen very easily for us working with semantic models is you might accidentally right click and in a power, uh, power query and change the type or remove a step. And then all of a sudden that, that column that was an integer becomes a text integer or a text column. And if it was used in a relationship, you're gonna get some weird behavior that you wouldn't necessarily normally um, be able to kind of understand or figure out until you take a look at the typing. Well, here you can kind of run a test and say, well, it, that column should be an integer and it was changed to a text. You're less likely to have those broken visuals. Um, the other thing is, is if you accidentally change a name, uh, this will tell you. And one of the most um, obvious representations of your project success is if you don't see the gray box of death. And, and when folks come to your Power BI report, you've just pushed your new semantic model to production and they open up the report and there's that gray box telling you something's broken and you get that phone call, it's, it's just deflating. And the schema test can help you avoid that um, from your team members who might just inadvertently not understand that, like changing that type or they just right clicked and didn't know that they, they changed that type or removed that column. This gives you a little bit of heads up before you move to production scheme uh, that your tests or your schema sound with, with your model. And this uh, code that I show you here when I run it, you can see that the, the schema it passed, but this code here 
I'm not going to write all that. I actually have an example here where if you just identify the the table. So if I change this to, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. If I change this to date dim and I run it, this actually writes out the whole schema. And so I can copy this and put it into my schema test. So it's a little bit of like DAX writing DAX for you. Uh, so what our teams do is we'll, we'll make changes and when we get close to having our, our certain version of the model we want to push out, we'll take the snapshot of the schemas, load it into the schema test, and then that way, as we're making changes, if these tests fail, we either adjust the schema or take a look at why it broke because we weren't expecting the schema to change. Um, and that avoids that, that horrible gray box of death. And so these tests can test the, the content and the schema. And this, this might be a good time to um, take a, a step back on, well, you saw all these tests, what kind of tests should I write? Um, I always tell folks that when you're testing, don't just write tests for test sake. When you're getting introduced to this pattern, think about the problem uh, cases that you have with your DAX measures or the, the issue you had last week with Power Query that you had to fix. Those are the tests that you want to start building uh, test cases for to avoid those problems being in production again. And slowly but surely, as a, an issue crops up, you write a test for it. Another issue crops up, you write a test for it. And then slowly but surely, you're building a foundation to avoid regression errors. And you'll be surprised that if you have the mentality that every time you see some of those errors and you need to fix it, whether or not that's in your test environment or production environment, you're going to quickly build a set of tests that can avoid introducing those issues again or any new issues, especially in the case of like schema testing that you didn't expect. And this also lets you build that suite and keep it with the Power BI desktop file. That's the thing I really like about the, the DAX query view is when I save this, it actually saves with Power BI desktop. So if I publish this or I save it to OneDrive or I save it to Git, and somebody else downloads that file, it stays with the tests and all these tabs stay with the file. And so now you have your test typely coupled and there should be no excuse that a, you, um, your teammate who opens this up can't just go through each one of these tabs that are listed as tests and make sure those tests are run. So for us in, in areas that we can't do automation, we'll just have a lot of these tabs here and just have a policy like, hey, did you run through all those? tabs and make sure all the test cases have passed. If yes, all right, we can we can look at um, doing a pull request or moving the, the code or the data set into the next environment. If it's not, let's investigate, figure out why the, that test didn't pass. Either we need to adjust the test or we need to adjust the code because something will break when we move it to production. And so I hope hopefully you've got an idea of how kind of the basis for the DAX query view pattern is set up. I'd like to switch real quickly back to the slides so you have a chance. I want to talk about some of the prerequisites you're going to need in order to apply this DAX query view testing pattern. So obviously that first one, and we spent a good amount of time on, was introducing DAX query view and the pattern itself of testing. But if you really want to lay the foundation to have this pattern be successful, you also should consider looking at the PBIP format. Now, PBIP is a, a new format, and I know many of you might be looking at it saying, oh, it's in preview. Um, I can tell you if you have uh, don't have the PBIR format turned on, which I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, I've used this in production. I have had no issues having PBIP format be used. Um, what's really beneficial about the PBI format is if you're embracing Git, we can actually keep our versions of Power BI files as flat files and actually understand what those changes are. And so what, what do I mean by that? Let, let me show you just what we can do with the PBIP format that's really powerful. So if you're looking at this uh, Power BI desktop file, if you go to options and go to preview, you'll see this option. 
You might see a couple more options available. I would advise you just try to keep it with the PBIP. I haven't had any issues with uh, just the, the, the straight, um, the, the version of the PBIP that doesn't introduce Tyndall or PBIR just yet and been using production environments. When you set that check mark here, that green check mark and hit okay, you're gonna have to close Power BI and open it back up so it understands that that feature needs to be available. Now, when you do that, and I go back to Power BI, when you go to the Save As feature, you're gonna see a new option for PBIP. And when you save that, you're gonna be asked to pick a folder. And when you save it to a folder, you're gonna see it's saved to a folder in these three things here. You're gonna see a sample model report, sample model, semantic model, and a PBIP file. And so what Power BI project file does is instead of it being in that classic PBIX format, which is a binary, it actually breaks everything out into flat files. Um, and text files or flat files uh, are wonderful for version control because we can actually tell line by line what's changed. So if you're wanting to see what Power Query changed or what DAX has changed, this format makes it a lot easier to do that. Now in the past, if you're using a PBIX file, you usually have to download the one version from the one workspace and download it from the other space, pull both of them up and kind of look to see what's changed. Um, even the deployment pipelines, they do some sort of comparison they don't really tell you as much. This gives you line by line what's changed, uh, which is really, really powerful. So uh, it also gives you the ability to store your DAX queries that I had in the DAX query view as individual files. And so that is really nice because now you can keep track of each individual test case in, in Virtual Control as well and see what those test cases have changed. And so if you have it in the PBIP format, let me show you how you can take advantage of the DEX query view plus Git integration, because that's, that's going to lay the foundation fully for the pattern. And that's where the Azure DevOps comes into play, Visual Studio Code and PowerShell Core. And so if this Azure DevOps is something that in your organization, uh, for most of you, is, is something that's available, um, if you're learning Azure DevOps for the first time, it's actually free for your tenant for up to four licensed users. So it's a, it's a great way to get introduced into um, continuous integration, continuous deployment. Visual Studio Code is a free tool to download um, and install. And PowerShell Core is, is free to download and install as well. So with those, those in mind, I'm going to flip over to the browser real quick and show you a project that I have in Azure DevOps. This is where I wanna store my PBIP file that I can share with the rest of my team. And so I've created a repository, I've got a project, and now I wanna be able to add that Power BI file, PBIP format file to the, <clears throat> to, to the repository so my teams can interact and we keep track of version control. And so now I've got this option up at the top here called clone. And if I clone this, I should get a little button that says clone in VS Code. If I hit clone in VS Code and I have VS Code installed, and one other uh, important prerequisite is you should have Git installed on your machine uh, so that we can push it up and up. Git, there's Git for Windows, Git for Linux. Um, you should be able to install it for free. Uh, in the instructions that I have in the uh, README file for, for this pattern, it kind of walks you through. Here's the link to do the installations and everything. So if I hit the open button, I'm going to get asked to save it somewhere. Um, I want to set up my desktop here for Git. I'm going to select that repository. And down at the bottom here, it's going to ask to clone it. And I want to open this up in a new window. And as you can see, at this point, all I have is a README file. For those of you who aren't familiar with Visual Studio Code, your kind of file explorer um, shows up here on the left. 
And if I go back to the Power BI report that I have, and I go to browse where I want to save that format. So if I go to where my Git file is, documents, go to Git, and go to my, should I have my folder here? Hopefully you could save it there. Might have saved it to a different folder. No, nope, it's here. Okay. I'm just going to go back, go directly to here. All right. So I've gone to the folder where my Git repo is cloned and click on PBIP and save. And if I go back to Visual Studio, you can see instead of just the README file, I've got those files there in the PBIP. And I can expand on them and take a look at the files I have. Um, you'll also notice a file that wasn't visible in File Explorer, but there's a git ignore. <clears throat> Quick aside, this is what's really cool about PBIP from a security perspective. When you commit your code to Git, the data that resides in that file that, that you can have on your desktop doesn't go into the repo. The ABF file is ignored. So this ABF file actually stores the data. So from a security perspective, this is really powerful because the only thing that's getting stored in the Git repository is the uh, information about how the report is rendered and the information of how, how the data should be transformed, but the data itself doesn't sit up in there. So I've worked with a lot of organizations who are always wary about like putting PBX files in repos because it just adds another layer of exposure. And having PBIP format is more secure because you you remove the data from, from the component. If you're using RLS, or level security, object level security, and maybe you as a developer have access to more data than the other team member, this also is very helpful because that data is not going to sit up in the, the service for somebody to uh, into the Git repo for somebody to download and maybe have access to data that they shouldn't have. So that's what's really nice about PBIP. So I've got the report here. I've got the model. Now, let's say I want to push it to the Git repo for somebody else to be able to, to leverage later. Um, I can go to this Git button here. And I may be asked to set some credentials up, but let's Let's go ahead and type in initial and hit commit. So in this case, from a Git perspective, you are committing the code locally. So you have a version of, of the Git repository locally, and you're going to sync globally. And when you sync, that actually should push it to the Azure DevOps repository for other members of your team to be able to sync and get the latest changes. And so if I hit the sync button, this can take a couple seconds, depending. Oh, there we go. And if I hit refresh, now you see the code is sitting up in the repository. So at this point, I've got the code in the repository. I've written all my tests locally. We can now take the next step and be like, oh, well, now that I have it here, if this version I want to have synchronized with my Power BI workspace, I don't have to hit publish anymore. I can actually go to my Power BI workspace or my Fabric workspace. Um, this will actually work with premium per user, premium and Fabric workspaces. So I've got a blank workspace here. If I go to workspace settings and go to the Git integration, There's now two options. I can either use GitHub or Azure DevOps. For this demo, I'm going to show you the Azure DevOps approach. You'll see you can connect with your account. And now I just picked from some drop down menus to identify the project, the repository, and the branch that I want to sync this repository with or this workspace with. So I pick that automated tested Git demo, try pass, pick the main branch. 
Um, I only had the main branch, but as, if you're uh, learning Git, you can actually separate, have a dev, test, and production branch, and have one workspace that's connected to uh, each of those branches, so you have a true dev, test, prod um, connection. If I hit connect and sync, what it's going to do is connect to that repository, identify all the Power BI artifacts um, or Fabric artifacts that it can sync, depending on the type of workspace. It's going to pull in the model first, and then it's going to pull in the report. And if all goes well, you'll see that this has been synced. And just a word of warning, the first time you click on the report, you're going to see something like this. And that's because since the data didn't go into the repository, um, you actually have to refresh the model before these, these things will render. So if I go back here and just hit refresh, and let's go ahead and just take a look at the refresh history that looks like it completed. If I go in here and refresh now, you'll see now the, the data appears. So just a word of warning, the first time you work with Git integration, when you sync, the data doesn't come with it, so you're going to have to refresh the the uh, semantic model. So now that you've got this integrated, this really sets up the pattern that you can have your testing in your file, you can have your uh, code being tracked, and you can have it automatically integrated with your workspace. And so this is the kind of the foundation for the DAX preview testing pattern. And there's a couple of things I want to show you in addition that makes this uh, a little easier when you're, when you're adopting the data ops principles of version control and testing. And that is, if I was to go into this Power BI report now, and let's say I change this measure, or I'll save that, or if I was to go into my transform here and add a filter, and save that and apply that it's going to run and i save it if i go back to where i was with the source control oh didn't save let me just save that real quick There we go. Now you'll see that it actually identifies what's changed. And so I can see that the date dimension was changed and the measure was changed as well. Now the format I'm using is Tyndall. Um, if you're using the, the basic version without that checkbox, you'll actually have the, the dot BIM or model dot BIM, which is the classic way of doing it. But you'll get a similar look and feel here of what's changed and what that's really nice and you can see that version history as well um, in azure devops you can also see where maybe somebody added a new filter or removed one so if i save this now hopefully it's saved looks like it's saving the report.json file also indicates that something has changed. Now, what's a little different right now at this point is it was a lot easier to see the changes in Tyndall or the model. Right now, I kind of liken the report.json. This is the JSON representation of the report. It's kind of like reading the matrix after a while, and that might date myself referencing the matrix, but you look at this and you look at the code. After a while, this makes sense. But the first time you kind of understand what's changed, it's a, it's a little hard to understand. But still, you can see what's there's been a change in the report. So at least if you're looking at this and somebody's like, no, I didn't change the report. And you look and then you see they added a filter and that filter might not be something that you want to have by default. That's that's good to know. Or, you know, the other thing you can always check to see is like, did you save it where the first tab is open? And if I went back to the report, you can see up at the top here, it's actually going to tell us what like the default 
um, tab number is, which is really nice. You can see if you're doing something um, where the first tab renders and maybe not the, the second by default. So pretty cool that you can keep track of these changes and keep track of the tests. In addition to keeping track of the, the, the changes here, having it in Visual Studio Code and seeing it also opens it up to automating some other uh, components locally. So in the Dex query view, uh, I noticed that after a while when you're working with teams, uh, let's say I've got one, two, three, four, you know, four tests here. I could almost have 20 tests uh, with a larger semantic model. Asking somebody to click on this and click on this and see if all the tests pass is a little arduous. Um, so with it being in PBIP, I've introduced a, a capability that you can run those tests locally and run through them all. So if you're familiar with JavaScript or C Sharp, this, this might be old hat or you know common feature, but we've never had this in Power BI before. So if you actually install a PowerShell module that I've open source it's called Invoke DQV testing. It's called data um, or Dex query view testing. When you install that, you have the ability to run this command. And when you give it the local flag, it will actually take a look at the Dex queries that you have with the .test extension and look at the Power BI file that you have open locally. And if you hit this, it will actually run through all the tests and tell you how many have passed and how many have failed. Now, I've introduced a lot of failures just so I can highlight it for you. But you've got, it will actually show you which test, which file. So this is column.test. So if I was to go back to here, I have a failure at some point in that file. And it'll also indicate whether the test has passed too. And at the bottom, you'll get this kind of results. And so for the teams where we can kind of automate and use PowerShell, we'll actually use PBIP, write our tests, and then use this code to say, hey, you know, instead of clicking on all the tabs, just run this code and it will query, run through all the tests, and then tell you, did any of the tests fail? And this makes it a lot easier to kind of make a change, hit a, hit a, um, a one line of invoke DQV testing, and if everything's green, go ahead and sync it with the with the branch uh, in the repository. All right. So, quick recap: what I've showed you today with the Dex query view testing pattern is you can have somebody as an analyst use Power BI Desktop, Visual Studio Code, save it in the PBIP format commit it to Git, and we synced it with the workspace, and our tests are included in everything that we saved. So hopefully this kind of inspires you to, to see how you can use version control today with Microsoft Fabric, weave in the DDoS principles of version control, but also weave in testing at the same time because of the DAX query view capability that was introduced with um, Power BI Desktop and Microsoft Fabric. All right, so Kevin, I think this is a good starting uh, stopping point to open it up to any questions. I've been talking almost a straight hour, so hopefully there's some questions out there. If not, we can jump to the next pattern. Uh, no questions, so I'd say let's jump. Okay, all right. So um, many of you might be looking at uh, this kind of pattern going, all right, so I've got I've got my stuff integrated with Git. I've got a, a DAX query view testing pattern. And now I want to automate it so that I can make sure that the tests that are that I've built, painstakingly built, are actually running on a continuous manner. Um, maybe I have a set of developers who aren't familiar with the process or maybe just forget to run that invoke DQV testing local. 
uh, before they committed. But I want to make sure that my files are tested and we continue to test. And if they're if they're good to go, then I know I can move them to the next stage or test workspace or production workspace, or even run these tests against test in production occasionally just to see if everything's okay. And so this next pattern I want to show you is the PBIP deployment and DQV testing pattern. And this is taking advantage of the Microsoft Fabric APIs. So this pattern does require you to have access to the Microsoft Fabric APIs. Um, if any of you are working in GCC or one of the US sovereign tenants, this pattern doesn't work yet. I'm hoping soon uh, for those who are working in commercial environment, uh, this pattern works today. Okay, so um, let me kind of illustrate this pattern before we kind of show you it from the, the technical perspective. So we've got our analysts commit saving the stuff to PBIP, they're committing it to Azure DevOps. At that point in Azure DevOps, we can leverage something called Azure Pipelines to validate our semantic models in our reports. And so what it's going to do is automatically kick off the publication of our semantic model to our workspace. And so in this kind of uh, demonstration, let's assume we're working with a development workspace. This isn't for production. This is deploying to development and testing in our shared development workspace. We'll publish the changes to the semantic model. Then we'll publish the report changes. Um, we can't publish the report first because we need the model to be there. And then we're gonna test the refreshes of the semantic model. There's nothing more important to validate the content to make sure that we can actually refresh the data. You know, if somebody put in a, a static import of a CSV file on their local drive, that refresh won't work. Or if you haven't set up the gateway connection correctly, that refresh won't work. You should know about it. And then the fourth and final step is to invoke the DQV testing. That same PowerShell module that we ran our test locally, we will also run the same tests against the semantic models and the service and tell you whether or not they passed or failed. And then um, it will indicate whether or not any of those steps has failed in the process. So what you're going to need to make sure to have this pattern is you're going to need to have the DEX query view testing pattern in place. You're going to need Azure DevOps, which is number two. And you're also need, going to make sure that you have XMLA turned on um, and have a service principle. Now, if you don't uh, have a service principle, can't use service principles uh, for some reason. I have used this in a premium per per user environment with a with a um, a service account. So, like a a regular UPN at Kursky.net with a uh, with a Power BI license. Um, that's not the most optimal way to use it. Uh, service principles are much better, but you'll need to make sure you have XMLA and service principles or you have a, um, a service account in, in order to, to do this. The um, instructions that I provide give you links that tell you how to do all the installation or how to turn off each one of these. And finally, you're going to need a premium back capacity and it will work with PPU. Uh, I can tell you I've worked with it in Fabric and premium, premium per user and it, it works just fine. All right, so let's talk about this pattern a little bit further. So I'm going to switch over to a pipeline that I've created. And uh, one of the things that you, you're going to get asked to do in the instructions is on the left-hand side here, we had our repos. This is where we're storing our code. And then for the automation, we've got our pipeline. And the pipeline is what can be triggered anytime you sync or you want to run it every six hours, these pipelines can, can run a set of instructions. And they can also store credentials securely, um, encrypted credentials. And you can actually store that in the library. And let's say I click on this variable group. You can see here I can store my username, my tenant ID, and then you'll see where I have the secret. So if I have a service account, I would store my secret there. If I have a service principal, I'd store my client secret there as well. And the pipeline itself created a, a demonstration pipeline here is 
YAML. Now, this is yet another language if you're uh, just getting introduced to Microsoft Fabric that you have to learn. But I find this uh, having somebody on my team who's familiar with YAML and Azure DevOps is good, especially if you're working on a mid-sized or larger team. This is a set of instructions on what needs to be done with the Power BI reports and the semantic models when something changes. So you can see up here, I've got a set of parameters that indicate the workspace that I want to point it to by default. The trigger, so this indicates that anytime there's been a change to the main branch, I want to kick off this pipeline. And then I want to use this pool. So when you're running a pipeline, you need some sort of operating system to, to run the code. In this case, I wanted to want to run on the latest version of Windows. Nice thing about Azure DevOps is they give you these window or these um, provider hosted uh, VMs that you can run your code on and uh, don't necessarily have to set up your own environment to do the, the, the uh, pipelines. So when this runs, you can then also give it that testing credentials that I just spoke about and say, all right, for this pipeline, pull in those credentials so that you have something to work with to be able to log into the Power BI service and issue refreshes. And then this is the first kind of step here that it does is it's going to install all those PowerShell dependencies. This one should look familiar to you. That's the one that we installed locally and was able to run. The, this one allows us to log in to Fabric. This one allows us to refresh uh, semantic models. And then near the bottom here is one that comes from Microsoft currently. Uh, and a gentleman who runs the Power BI kind of dev mode project, Rui Romano, has worked on this PowerShell module. So a lot of the interaction that actually will upload the Power BI files and upload the, the report is uh, all provided in this module. So I didn't write it in the code. Um, I wouldn't be able to, to if you look at the code, Rui's much better at PowerShell than I am. I just borrow it and it's it's open source. So that's the wonderful thing about this is we just use this PowerShell module. And then what this PowerShell module is going to do, or the next step is it's going to deploy the semantic models. And so first thing it's going to do is, is kind of pull in all the environmental variables that we have from that variable group and then use a, a login to log into Fabric. So that's that set that Fabric auth token, whether it's a service principal or a service account. Log in, and then this is uh, thanks to um, ChatGPT. This actually identifies, uh, this is the Git instructions that identify what's changed. So in this deployment pattern, I'm really only interested in what's changed when you committed the code in the last couple of two commits, because that's what I really want to test. Um, you could have it run all the tests if you wanted to, um, and you wouldn't necessarily need these uh, these head aspects of the, the Git differentials. But in a lot of environments, I want this to run quickly, and I only want it to run on the reports and the data sets that have changed. And so this kind of code identifies that and stores that in variables. And then it, what it will do is go through each one of the semantic models and start setting up the identification of what we need to promote. And then this will actually promote, this is what that import fabric item will do, is it actually runs through this code um, and imports the semantic models into the service. And then what it will then do is promote the reports. So you can see here, promotes the reports. And then it does a couple things that um, I don't necessarily want to go into the nitty gritty here. But when the report you have is running locally, it's connected to your semantic model that's open locally. We need to be able to tell that report that like, hey, when I publish this, go ahead and connect to the semantic model that I've also published. Uh, and so that way, just kind of the plumbing needs to be connected. This makes sure that when it publishes to the service, it's connected. 
And then near the end here, what it's going to do is run a refresh test. It will actually, let me zoom down a little bit here. It actually goes through each of the promoted semantic models and issues a refresh. And then once the refresh com completes, it will run the tests that are sitting in your Dex query view uh, folder. And what that looks like, if you're tired of looking at the, uh, the YAML code here, is it will produce test results that identifies Here's the items that need to be promoted, promotes those items, and then it will run through the test cases. And you can see here, it's running all those same test cases I have. This is a different version. I didn't push to this repo, but it runs through all those tests. And if all the tests pass, you see I get all the green check marks. If the tests fail, let's see if we can go to one that's failed. I don't know if I have any failed recently. Um, you'll get, here we go you'll get test results that look like this. And it will highlight that there's a failure and fail the pipeline. And if I hit back here, you'll notice that the errors are also shown up here. When it fails, the other nice thing about this is um, in Azure DevOps, you can have an admin that can send you a message. Um, so you can be working as a project manager or a technical lead, have your pipelines running and you can get notified if you're if these pipelines are failing. Um, and so if you're talking to your, your development team and they're like, oh yeah, I, I pushed it. Um, and then you get a notification that it broke and you'd be like, hey, you need to fix this. Or your team should be monitoring this to see, oh, those, those have uh, failed and we, we need to uh, address those issues. And so this is a, a nice way of having this automation occur so that you have all those tests running you can schedule in on any time there's a, a, a trigger of an update to the branch and make sure that before you move it to test and production, the tests are passing and the refreshes are in good shape. And you can take this pattern and extend it to test and production as well. But this pattern uh, has worked really well for us where if we kind of focus on dev, make sure everything passes there, we're in pretty good shape to move it to test and production. And this YAML code that I went through in the instructions, I actually give you this code that you can download and copy and paste into here. So you don't have to write this code. You can copy and paste it. And with a couple of updates to the, the pattern or to the variables, you should be in, in good shape. You can test this out in your own Azure DevOps in, environment. So just to, to recap, you, you definitely need to have Azure DevOps. You have to have XML and service principles started. You need to have a premium back workspace, but this is kind of going that next step. If you really have a lot of semantic models and you want to automate the testing and make sure as a, as a technical leader or project manager that the testing is occurring on a regular basis, you can put in these checks to make sure that when it's in that workspace, it, it has been tested. The other thing you can take since we got uh, some more time is I recently wrote an article that introduces um, not only this pattern, you can extend it to copy those test results to one lake. And if you think about it, we, we work very hard in this industry to build reports and dashboards that evaluate the processes of the financial organizations or HR or, or some organization. We don't necessarily always look inwards and have dashboards that evaluate how well are we developing? How well are we testing? How often are we introducing errors in production or errors in the development? Well, if we can take these test results and copy them to one lake, we have the ability to build our own dashboards because we can store it in Delta, we can create dimensions, and we can have our own reporting on the tests. So if you've got a bunch of pipelines running, a bunch of semantic models, and what you wanna do some analysis of how often is this pipeline failing, what tests are failing the most, which person on my team is having issues that having the most tests that are failing, maybe there's some remediation training we need to apply. 
this is what the beauty of having the ability with fabric we can copy those test results and in the pattern um, i skipped over this as i was explaining the prior pattern but near the end here i want to show you you can use something like az copy and it will copy that those test results that i showed you to to one lake and I have uh, an example here where I've got all these test files and those tests that I had in the service get saved as CSV. And then we have a, um, a fabric notebook that will then load that data into a bunch of Delta files or uh, Delta tables. And so now I can actually build a star schema that identifies which tests I'm running, which projects I have, when those tests are running and this in specific time they were running as well and whether or not they passed or failed and so what's nice about fabric is now i've gotten this ability to not only run my tests in an automated fashion but store those results in fabric and start weaving in reporting that is going to show how well uh, my team is developing power bi reports or when issues come up and for for me and my teams when we have the ability to show customers that we have a robust testing area we have rollback and version control capabilities and oh by the way we have a dashboard that tells us how well we're doing it goes a long way in give, instilling confidence in our clients and our customers that we're actually going to build reports that are reliable and in the future as we augment the team or grow we can scale to be able to support them in the future. And that's where those data op principles sitting in the back of our mind, having version control, having testing, looking for automation, that is that is kind of critical to making sure that we're successful. So with that, Kevin, I'll, I'll open it up to, to questions. Um, this is the, the slide deck that uh, I, I provide within the slide deck. I've got the link to all the templates um it has the link to the blog articles so if you're interested in um in trying any of these components out of these patterns out uh hopefully you've got some templates to get started with all right thank you for that and if there are any questions for john let's get them in chat i'll vamp for just a moment as we wait for questions uh so far nothing but i want to say appreciate you taking the time this evening to talk to us about a couple of patterns here. It's been quite informative and looking like no questions, but that's okay. So uh, with that, we're going to wrap things up for the evening. Again, thank you so much for taking the time out this evening to uh, present. Appreciate that, Kevin. Thanks. Yep. Or let me uh, wax philosophically about data ops and uh, talk about testing. So, uh, Of course. Uh, comment in chat. No questions, but this was an amazing presentation. Thank you. And I agree. Oh, well, thank you. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate it. And with that, we are going to wrap things up for this evening. So thank you, everybody in chat, for hanging out with us for a little bit. Our next meeting will be in a couple of weeks, second week of September. We're going to have another round of advanced DBA, third week main meeting, fourth week data science, business intelligence, a couple shop talk episodes along the way. But until we do see each other in a future TriPass meeting, everybody take care. <laughs>